And we could just jump right to your question if you want to do the question and then um, um, come back. Yes, we're going to do oh. question and answers and then a brief synopsis on people's week of the garden and then we're going to focus on uh, garden uh, preparing stuff. So we could start right, right into it with Valerie's question if you have that set up, Michael. Okay, here we go. Here's Valerie's question. This is yours, Valerie, very right. Yep, that's it. Okay, what, instead, of, what, instead of everybody reading this, why don't you just explain the question? Uh, well, this is a, a little tree that I thought was about four times the size you see now. It's a Japanese coral bark maple that I planted uh, a couple of years ago and last winter, not this past winter, the winter before, I guess. It, was it last winter, winter before, whatever. Anyhow, the deer rubbed off all the bark, and so it died down to about a foot tall. And um, uh, this is what it looks like now. It started to grow back in the, last, uh, in the last year, but there is a very strong branch growing toward the right. There are a couple of branches that are growing more or less with, with less of, a, of an angle up. And I'm wondering, uh, I, I was hoping that that a branch would take over that would be, you know, going perpendicular to the ground. But this really strong branch to the right seems to be the strongest one. I'm wondering if I should trim that one off so the other ones have a chance to go straight up. Anyone want to give their uh, opinion on this? or uh, advice? I mean, it looks very healthy. The, the coral bark is really much, you don't see it so much in this picture, but the coral is really bright and it's really looking very good and healthy, even though it's, it's mutilated. Anyone? Sarah maybe, or uh, Garrett, or uh, anyone? I'm not, I'm not much of a tree expert, I'm more of a, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I got a trees. No, I uh, also know next very little about trees. Kelly, who, who does our orchard, is still in Hawaii. Jarrett was going to answer. Go ahead, Jarrett. Um, the one thing that I know, I have a friend who does, who, who's really good with trees. And the only thing that I've ever seen is he keeps them potted for about five or six years until they get really, really strong. And I realized that this one was, was big at some point and then it got mutilated down, but maybe what you want to do, the best thing that I would think that you could do is if you, if you're worried about it, just let it grow for a little while, wrap as, wrap some kind of bushing around it to keep the deer off of it so they don't come back at it again. And, and then if it gets big enough, at some point, trim off the limb that you think is, is growing in the wrong direction. But I don't think that it, it's going to inhibit the growth. And this is just a thought of mine. I don't think it's going to inhibit the growth of the other two limbs that are growing straight. It's just well, if you no, the, the, real, the real question is, I don't want it to be growing strongly out to the side. I did wrap it in burlap this past winter. And so it lived through the winter. Uh, I'm not concerned about its health. I know it's growing, but I'm concerned about its shape. Valerie, maybe you want to, maybe you just want to stunt trim the, the, the limb that's growing off towards the side. You know what I mean? Maybe you want to cut it, cut it, cut a little bit off and see how that works. See if that gives more, more strength to the, to the other two growing up. I don't, I don't well, know. Well, if I cut a little that. bit off, then it'll start to branch up off from where I cut it off. Yeah, so cut uh, I mean, either I cut the whole thing or uh, the whole, that whole branch off or not. I have a suggestion, Valerie. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, this is Steve. Yes. You, uh, you could also try training that branch by putting a stake uh, near the central leader and tying it off with some cloth and trying to train that branch to go the direction you want it to do. I, I, I should know. Kind of like kids. That's right. Yeah, no, I've done that with another tree on my property that uh, was going off in the wrong direction. I, I could do, do that. It just seemed that this branch was so strong that, um, I, I don't know, I'll try that. It's not a bad idea. 
right. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to leave now then. Yes, Thank enjoy you. your other committee. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> right. Okay, um, I'm going to let's see. Okay, so here's. So just quickly, here's the tonight's agenda. We're going to start with questions from beginners. Well, we actually had one from Valerie. Uh, and we have a number of questions today. A lot of people sending good questions. Then we have weekly update and Garrett and Steve have agreed to tell us what they're doing in their gardens this week. Then we have a few announcements before we have the, um, the shimmy in place exercise. <laughs> and our discussion topic for tonight will be garden preparations. We don't really have a speaker on that. So we're sort of hoping everyone will just participate in, in, in that. So let's see, here's the first question. What is this in my garden? And do, does the person who brought this question up want to say anything else about them? Gail's waving to us. Um, well, the one on the left, I know grows very tall and has some kind of flower coming out, but I don't know what it is and whether I should leave it in my garden, if it does any good, if it's a good pollinator. I, I, don't, I actually don't know what it is. And the one on the right looks familiar. I didn't plant it um, and I don't know what it is. So does anybody recognize them? I recognize the one on the left uh, and it does put out a, uh, a spike about midsummer and usually has yellow flowers. Right, yeah. Um, I leave them in my garden just because I think they look fun. Okay. They're, they're called mullen, I believe, right? I don't recall the name. It's a mullet family. I mean, it's technically a weed, but it can be kind of pretty. Mm -hmm. This one. Wasn't that the one that a couple weeks ago someone talked about how uh, if you need toilet paper, you can use that so they weren't pulling their mullen this year? Am I wrong about that? I, I thought it was on this, this show. Maybe I'm, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm mem misremembering things, please, please straighten me out soon, folks. <laughs> How tall does this one get? I, I don't know. Um, it's very—it's about two feet already. It's just popped up. Hmm. You've never seen it before? No, it. I had borage in that um, location last year, and I don't. Oh think it yeah. Ah. Is it borage? It could be. Well, very well. Yeah, they, 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 not, they definitely. Not, no. I thought it looked different. <laughs> and. Boris doesn't have those uh, spiky leaves. That's what I thought. Hmm. Okay. Well, I do have another question. No photograph. I got um, composted manure um, from Sweetman's this year. A lot of it. So if anybody wants some. But it's full of weeds. And now my garden is covered in weeds. Is there anything I could do? Pull them up. Just pull them up. Well, how, how big is your garden? Do you have a very large space or is it a smaller garden or? Um, I mean, I have quite a Everyone, few. Sorry, please mute in the back. Someone's uh, making noise. So, it's not that big that I can't pull them up. Um, in some areas though, I've already planted beets and yeah, it's hot. Oh, the beets are almost indistinguishable from all the weeds now. Um, so I can wait, but yeah, I was just wondering whether it was worth getting composted manure from a local farm when now I'm... I'm Folks, I'm sorry, I just want to interrupt you one thing. I'm going to do the mute all. You'll be able to unmute yourself when you need to speak, but somebody's got some background noise going, so I just want to do this, so we're... So we're... Okay, and anybody can unmute themselves when they really are planning to speak and, and join the conversation. We, we had the same problem last year in the community garden. We were given some composted manure, and as the season went on, we discovered it had seeds in it. So, and we knew it came from there because they were unfamiliar weeds, weeds that hadn't been there last year. So, I mean, if you want to put plastic or something down over the areas that you're not ready to plant, and you get enough sunlight, it might kill some of it off. But if you haven't planted most of your garden, let them grow up 
you know, let them come up a bit and then, you know, hoe them out, which is, I mean, hand weeding takes forever, but you get a good old hoe out there and keep working them off, um, you'll diminish, diminish the uh, weeds where you've already planted and let, you're going to have to hand weed is all the only way I know. You know, take a hoe on the clear areas and then hand weed in between. I know it's frustrating. It happened to us. Here's the next question. And, and actually, this is my question. Uh, when, we, uh, ren we, when we moved in in 2012, we renovated and we took these boards out of the walls. And I used it to make raised beds. And they worked for like six years or something. But they're, at this point, they're breaking down. You know, they, they had a good run, especially since they were secondhand. My brother has these really cool, it's like um, almost like cement block or something that he stacks around his beds. And, and then you can even grow stuff in. Does anybody know where I can get a good source of those? And actually, I think my brother got something. It was like some sort of building process where they, they built these cement things. And then afterwards, they were extra. So basically, all he had to do was drive his pickup truck over and get them. Does anybody have any good idea where I can get some good replacement or something to put around those beds? This is Carly. Michael, we're using, um, we're actually using leftover firewood that is like about that high around some of our beds and it looks pretty good, but it does break down <laughs> just like yours did. Obviously. I've got, um, out in the, the woods behind us, we've got a bunch of old cedars and I've, and I actually have a bed that is cedar. It's just that I was thinking, okay, and a cedar would last a long time. That may be what I end up doing. Garrett, you have to take yourself off mute. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have a question about using cedar. D does that inhibit the soil, or w does what's that do to the soil if you use cedar plank around the bed of a garden? Um, gee, all I thought was that the cedar just took a very, very long time to break down. Uh, but I, right. I just I just wonder if it adds a certain element to the to the to the garden um, because it has oils and it cedar has oil and that's one of the reasons why it takes so long to break down if it's going to inhibit plant growth or not and I and I and I don't know the answer to that question I just saw a friend of mine did uh, cedar plank around his garden this week and uh, I was inspired but um, I was just wondering I, I think Doc uses cedar for her raised beds. So, <laughs> okay. Well, I will check that out. Let's yeah, see. As far as as far as I know, cedar is very you know is a good strong wood. I don't think the, mm -hmm. unless it's, unless it's overly treated or something you know unless someone got a real, but otherwise it's it's one of the better more expensive you know raised very beds. So I, I think if you can get it, that that's very good. And Michael, I was going to say, I mean, you could use wood, or you know, you could maybe check uh, Craigslist or something. You know, sometimes people are getting rid of stuff. Or, uh, you know, or you could use different things, like, you know, you could use rocks or, uh, you know, you could be creative with your raised beds. It doesn't always have to be wood. Cinder blocks, I see here on the chat. Right, you know, if you, like, if you have extra stuff lying around or, uh, you know, you could use that. You, you, know, you just want to keep the soil in there. So it doesn't always have to be officially, uh, you know, wood. Right. It looks really great, but actually this got a layer of, um, this is a wood chip beside it, but it's got a layer of, um, dried leaves and stuff there that are just really brown at this point. But below, below that, the, oh, the soil is so black. So you, you don't see that, but it's, it's under there, it's good. Let's go to the next question. Oh, so, oh sorry, Natalia, you just said face plate, uh, Facebook Marketplace. A lot of people find stuff. Facebook Marketplace, if you want to check that. Okay, and now, uh, Ginny, do you want to explain your questions here or? Where's Ginny? Oh. Let's see. There she is. Okay, sorry. <laughs> She's going over to Jack's screen, I noticed. I yeah, yeah, you saw me over there. Yeah, we're helping each other. Um, you know, so we have a lot of raised beds, and um, there are some that are older and functioning better because of soil. The soil is better, and some of the newer beds we've changed our procedures due to just certain certain circumstances. 
and I've noticed that, um, I, I don't know, I'm just having troubles with these new beds and I'm, I'm hopeful. So one of my questions is, um, uh, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, do more mulch in the new soil. These new beds are about five years old. Um, and I see some things like ants and, and spiders and, and only a couple of worms. And I'm just wondering, am I, I think I'm going in the right direction. I'm, you know, adding mulch along the way, but I just see like tons of ants, these tiny ants. And it just, I, I don't know, I'm happy to see life in the soil, but the other hand, I'm like, am I moving in the wrong direction? I don't know if that's too broad of a question. Anybody have any thoughts? Well, I would say, what do you know? Uh, do you have a picture or anything of the bed or? Uh... Uh, uh, no, I, I took a picture, but it's not of the ants or the whatever. So I have more clay than and anything then, else. Then, did you did you just leave it bare over the over the winter, or did you cover it or? Uh... All right. So great question. Um, these beds are about the new beds are about five years old. I uh, planted, rotated for about three years, and then the fourth year I left them all of them totally barren because I was so fed up with the pests and the disease, and I the mulch was not proper. So last year was the first, and so I don't do anything over the winter other than make sure that all of the, um, you know, the residue or the weeds or whatever, everything is, you know, I pull everything out. So it doesn't winter, meaning like the plants and stuff like that. Um, so last year was the first year I plant, I, I planted after the barren year and um, it was uh, just a, a lot of, I don't know, disease um, on the tomato plants. It's a couple of my other questions and that sort of stuff. So I didn't plant a lot. I was like, it, most of the beds are about three or four feet by eight feet. And there's about 21 of them, about eight of them, uh, six to eight are old, older beds and they're well mulched and they perform well. The newer beds past five years, the new beds, the other 16 or so, just having a problem with the soil and, and I'm, I, I actually, I thought it was a problem with me planting, but I really think it's a problem with the soil. So that's kind of when I went back to the basics and said, okay, so at least am I, the fact that I'm seeing some activity in the soil is that good, but it's mostly clay soil. So I don't know if that answers your question. My, my, my brother, um, you said you took out all of the, the plants from, like from this fall. Yes. Um, my brother, likes to leave stuff in and, and he refers to all the roots of old plants as worm chow. Oh. I don't how do how do other people feel about that? If you you get to the end of the autumn, do you like rip out all the you know the plants once they're done giving stuff or do you leave them in to let them sort of rot in place and feed the worms? What do people feel about this this pressing issue in the garden? There's two ideas that I've read across. One is most of the things that are there you should remove and as long as they're not diseased compost because what if there were some sort of insects or disease in there that you didn't realize you've left it in the soil the correct thing to do is to plant a fall cover crop which we never get around to doing that's that's the correct thing other people say and i believe this you should leave a strip of your garden or some of your garden maybe where you have your herbs or have some perennial flowers uh, not pruned down because there are certain beneficial insects some of the uh, butterflies and the good bugs that overwinter in those beds and by taking everything down you're you know getting rid of our our bees and good bugs so you need a balance wait so sarah could you uh just give an example some examples of some fall cover crops people you know actually there's, sure that. you can go to the um growers johnny's um high mowing seeds is good uh, another one i've used is territorial seeds and they they sell cover crop that is mixed for the season you're going into and they're usually a blend of uh, field pea, some vetch, uh, I forget some of the other, you know, Silver items. Or, uh... And the idea is in the spring, you don't remove those, you dig them in, adding more uh, nutrients to your soil. The other thing you can do in the early spring is you can plant spring cover crop also. 
for your, say your tomatoes, you're not gonna put your tomatoes in until late May, early June. And it's too late now, but if you put a cover crop in in March, that'll grow and you can turn that in. I also believe in adding, you know, the, the compost that the village makes, as far as I know, it's okay. We've used it in the past. It's free, better yet. And the other thing I have used for my flower beds, I live in a very old house with very strange soil, excellent to old trash piles. And I save all my coffee grounds. <laughs> and I'm a huge coffee drinker. And where I had really, really bad, bad soil, I would put like a small dog food size bag of coffee grounds down in there. And the worms love them. And the soil <laughs> gets, re you know, replenished really quickly. So you, yes, you have to work on your soil, it's the short answer. And there are a number of ways you can do it. I'm sure someone else here has other methods. Okay, that, that totally helps a lot. I know okay. that I need to work on my soil. Any mm -hmm. well, it's good. Just, just letting you know the chat had someone said, uh, you could leave your leaf clip, you know, chop up some leaf yeah, clippings, leaves. leave it there. Grass clippings. No, sorry, no, sorry. Mm -hmm. Like the main thing is what, how does your soil look? I mean, if you, Take a sample. I mean, do you know if it's acidic? Do you know, you said it's mostly clay. I mean, is when you touch it, is it like dried out and and is it loamy? I mean, that that's really the key as well. Like, right. how how is the soil? Yeah, great questions. And I've been playing with that for the uh, last year and this year. And the soil is not great, and we're working on it. Um, it's it falls apart in my hands. I tried to make. I I forget from the two two zooms ago. I don't know, it was a chat or someone said, you know, make a, a turd out of it and then yeah. try to make a worm. Anyway, I, you barely can make a turd and the worm falls apart. So, um, so I'm definitely working on the soil. I'm 100% clear that a lot of my pest problems are uh, probably because the soil is not appropriate. And so I guess I was just hoping that having ants and spiders might be working in the right direction, but I'm, I'm sensing that nobody really knows that answer until I get maybe another year under my belt or two to get some better soil. Right, I would say, you know, worms are, you know, ants and spiders probably not, you know, you want them there, but you know, worms and yeah. stuff ants under the soil. Ants I'm not a fan of. I love spiders. Yeah, right. But ants, you know, um, what was I thinking? Are you fertilizing at all? Um, in, in what would you call fertilizer? Well, most of the people here are organic, but there's fish, fish emulsion. You can, you know, use fish emulsion, that's organic. There are some organic fertilizers. And for your peppers and your tomatoes, we've always used uh, Epsom salt spray, and it's like a miracle. Regular old Epsom salts, you soak your feet in, Yeah. you put it into, I don't know, like a quarter cup or whatever into your spray thing, you spritz that on them if they're looking a little peaked and they grow. So there are additives that are organic that, you know, will help your garden. It doesn't have to tough it out all on its own. Okay, that, that's good to know. So the most I've ever really done is like cow manure or peat moss here and there, so. No, those are really good, but sometimes you need a little more. Okay. All right, so I think um, you know, I had a handful of questions. One was about the ants and the spiders, um, of the clay. Uh, just off the top of your head, if since I'm working with clay and I'm trying to work that through, does the cow manure and peat moss help it? Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. All right, good. Um, <clears throat> and then I had my tomato plants last year, just a lot of diseases like the septoria, like the um, leaves were all spotted and so I think I heard the answer to this earlier is that I should not allow that to be part of compost at all, mm -hmm. right? To put disease. Correct. Okay. All right. And um, I tend to over prune my tomato plants and um, could that lead to some of these issues as well? Tomato plants are almost an entire topic, I would say. First of all, if you're over, are you overhead watering? Um, last year, no, but the previous years, yes. So I know there's, I know it's splashing up sometimes for sure. Do you put straw down at the bottom of your plants? Yes. Hmm. Good or bad? No, you need straw because that prevents splashing. I'm surprised because last year was a good tomato year. Okay. 
year before was a terrible tomato year. All right. Yeah, you know, well, I'm, it's, it's a work in progress. I'm sure right. there's other things at play, but that, that helps a lot. Uh, the last thing I think I have was, um, and then Squash this is, bugs. yeah, I think it's related to the soil, but I mean, I don't know if they just got out of hand. I mean, we're talking thousands for like, I don't know, 10, you know, squash plants or something like that. Oh yeah. If you ever want to have a squash bug session. <laughs> uh, we got we got a tomato session and a squash bug session coming up. All right. Yeah, so we, we had um, serious several years ago. None of us really where I grew up. I don't know. I grew up with a huge gar you know, garden with my parents and we grew zucchinis, oh. no squash bugs. And then a few years ago in the community gardens, like all the squash died in one week. So I went on the, the uh, internet search and learned about squash bugs. They're nasty, nasty creatures. And you have to, we in the community garden have used what we call manual methods, which means we picked them off for years meticulously and got rid of them. Other than that, I think you'd, you'd think you have to spray, but most of you don't want to spray. But you know, that's, we could go into squash at some point if you want. Well, so let me ask you a question. That's great, because I've had some other pests that I have kept after, I mean, even from weeds, you know, from that perspective of like every year just being really meticulous about getting rid of them. So from the squash bug perspective, if I'm really like on top of it, it could get less and less every year. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Do they live in the soil over winter? Because that's why I stopped like planting for like a whole year. I'm just like, I'm stopping everything because it was so bad. But you're rotating your squash plants, right? Yep. Absolutely. Yep. I don't know precisely where they live. I know that you have to aggressively control them. And even with aggress and remember, we have a large garden and we have like 10 people or so out there looking for squash bugs. So <laughs> it's pretty intense. Okay. If you, if you don't really keep after them, I mean, they do come back. Yeah. Great. Good. Sorry. Great no, thank you. That's what I needed to hear. Jack, you're listening somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think you answered right. all my questions. Thanks. All right. Okay, we have a next one, Michael. This this was asked in the chat, and so I just posted here. Okay. Organic. Um, I've heard of this BT because I used to listen to a radio show called You Bet Your Garden, and they would talk about all this all the time. And apparently, it's a um, it's an insecticide. It's a um, it's a natural thing that you put in the soil. And when the, the worms eat it, their their body becomes a factory and makes more BT. Um, <laughs> and so it's hard on them, um, but it doesn't hurt anything else. That's that's what they say. Has, have others heard of this? Oh yes, I mean that's a lot. That some some uh, genetically modified foods they're trying uh, they're they're putting the BT in there, so that's becoming a little. Uh, controversial like we don't really know what the long-term effect of you know ah, people eating this. interesting so that that's uh yeah that's mm -hmm. I, I, I would be hesitant you know it supposedly is harmless right and, and if you could use it separately but right then right the thing is they've been genetically modifying foods to have the bt as part of the food and that uh i'm not a big fan of but i can't i'm not any type of expert in that so i wouldn't want to give good or bad advice on it um, i have used bt for many years. Uh, I don't use it every year, but I've used it when I have uh, big worm outbreaks. And um, you can spray it and you, I believe it's accurate that you can eat your produce um, up to a day after you've sprayed it. Um, and it's been pretty effective. There are many different varieties of BT. So you've gotta be very careful about how you're, uh, what you're purchasing and whether it's for you know, apple worms or cabbage worms or other kinds of worms, but there are many different varieties. And there's a lot of information on the internet about BT. And I consider it safe for my organic garden. Good to know. Yeah, well, and there's a little more information on the chat from uh, Christopher. 
He said it's a natural, it creates crystals in insect gut that rips the lining, causing death. Unknown if it has similar effects on human gut long term. Yeah, that's the that's the question. Unfortunately, we don't want to be the guinea pigs to find out. Okay, then we have what's an example of good fall cover crops? Oh, oh that's uh, some stuff Sarah mentioned. But yeah, that, that's called living mulch. That's a really good thing to really get into. That that would be a great. Um, thing i think when the season's over just to get these seeds and lay them out and let them grow and so it covers you know i'm not a bit i don't think soil should ever be bare i'm a big believer that you always should have some type of organic matter on your soil whether it be you know chopped up leaves or grass clippings as entire said or uh i think the best thing is living mulch all right oh you got stuff coming up you, you have any more questions Right. Oh, yeah. The last frost, last frost dates. So, sorry. I, May 21st. I, <laughs> okay. So Chris said May 21st. Nicole said May 7th. But Sarah, you're saying May 21st. Yeah. I, May 7th for your tomatoes and peppers. I wouldn't trust them. We're going to have, there's like a maybe a snow shower this week. I know. And you get so, you get so tempted when it's like 70 degrees. Like, it's, oh my God, everyone goes nuts. And then. No, it's, if you're committed to like, Baby, your plants and covering them and being crazy, but I wait until around May 20th because it's too much drama. One, one of the questions I have it's is dramatic. About, <laughs> one of the questions I have is about microclimates in Warwick. So, for example, I just, I just, um, we just ate our first asparagus tonight, um, and um, Jarrett was Garrett was saying. Um, um, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, he was seeing some, and and I know, like, if you go around the village, you'll see some people. Their magnolia trees are, you know, you, some are a lot earlier than others, and I'm wondering. So, for example, I know our our magnolia trees. I think magnolia tree, like, a couple of days ago, where the the blossoms were at the peak. Do other people have magnolia trees that were like way ahead or way behind that? And where are you? We're on the western ridge of the valley. I have magnolia in full bloom in Pine Island. Yeah, and, and I think it's an individual thing also, right? You, you're, you could certainly have a microclimate when one area is much cooler or you just, you know, asparagus could kind of come up early or a little later, like mine is just coming up now. So, uh, you know, I, I, was, you know, I was always getting ready to give up on them. But I think, oh yeah, who's, Steve, you were the one praising asparagus, right? Yeah. Yeah, hopefully I can follow your model and have them for the next 15 years. I had a quick question on asparagus since I have you there. Um, I just planted my last year and I see stalks coming up. Should I, uh, isn't that way too soon or is that, should I ignore those or? So there are different varieties. Some varieties allow you to do a light picking the first year. I have always let it go at least two years. But uh, some of the new varieties, um, I don't know what kind you bought, but um, there's a, there's a kind that I used called Super Male, and it's a Jersey variety. And I was able to do a very light harvest the first year. They were like pencils, and I just picked them for about two weeks and let them go. And then the second year, I had six weeks, and I've had consistently six weeks of asparagus ever since. Oh, nice. Okay. Isn't it a question of wanting to help the roots establish? That yeah. If you let them go that first year, yeah. you forego them. Then you're 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 basing to help the the roots build, and then that builds your. Right. Yeah. So even I, even I have thick stalks coming up. I should just let, let, leave them be, or cut them down, or just let them grow. Well, how, it, how patient are you? Yeah, how patient, and how many stalks per plant? That would be the other thing. If you had enough stalks that you feel like you've got at least five, six, seven that you can let go, and you can still harvest a few, I would say why not take a few? Huh. Okay, I'll see. Yeah, they're just coming up, so I'll see. No. All right, thank you. All right, so on the asparagus uh, forum here, I've had one or two asparagus plants for probably like seven or seven years or so. And the past two years, not getting a lot of crop, but, but that's really not my question. At the end of the six weeks or whatever it is, they all you know bloom out into these beautiful things, but they attract Japanese beetles. And, and those Japanese beetles are 
uh, get on to some of my other stuff. Um, yeah. So sometimes I just cut it all back and I just don't know if that's the right thing to do. I would not cut it back. I would go out there in the evenings uh, with a little bucket of soapy water and catch as many of those beetles as you can. Okay. They're also susceptible to asparagus beetles. That's what I, I don't have a problem with Japanese beetles, oh. but I've had a lot of asparagus beetles and they are very deft at dropping off the fronds and falling down to the ground or falling onto another branch. Um, so after a while, you get pretty good at getting this little bucket of soapy water underneath them and then just shake and they'll fall right into the soapy water. Um, but I'll, I, I would do that with Japanese beetles. I would, I would go out there and just pick, pick, pick. Yeah, it could be my mistake. Maybe they are asparagus beetles. So thank you, that's great. I yeah. appreciate it. But I would always leave asparagus, let it go into the fronds, into the, it looks like an asparagus fern, like people have yeah. house plants, and let that go right into the fall, to the late fall, and then I would cut it after it all browns out, after all the green is gone. Okay, thank you. I uh, see, so uh, you have any other questions, uh, Michael, there? Let's do, let's do one more question before, uh, before our, our sort of, we, we, we change modes a little bit. Well, I, when I, do, I do see one question on the chat too. Sorry, what the, uh, Natalia had about soil breakdown. Do you wanna? Uh, yeah, actually let's do that because this is, maybe we can save this. Steve sent this in. This is, you know, last week, um, uh, Bill McCoskey talked about how his garden notes were too difficult to decipher. And so Steve sent this in, but we're going to talk about garden prep in the second half. Maybe we can start off the second half with, with this one. Yeah. And we will good. switch to the question in the chat, which was. Do you want to ask it, Natalia? Sure. Okay. So, and I'm sorry for the camera. It shows up. It's actually at the bottom of my screen for some reason. It's <laughs> realized I don't like this laptop configuration. So I apologize. It looks like I keep looking up all the time. So. I live on the lake and we have the sediment in the lake that um, from time to time being dug up and I allowed the village to place the sediment from the bottom of the lake on my property. Now, I know that for a fact that the sediment is fertile because it's the leaves that fell in the lake and over time they just you know, accumulated there. So, but my question is, um, is it going to be fertile right away? Does it need to stay in brief? Does it need to air out? Because um, it's a lot of dirt and I just don't want to wait to plant the seeds. I would like to put the sod on it, but it's a lot of sod. So I don't want to buy sod, place it on top of the sediment that's been dug up thinking that the sod will maybe die, maybe this sediment will kill it. I don't know if it's extra nitrogen or what have you, but I don't know if anybody had experience with um, understanding what does it take for soil, organic soil to break down when it's not, you know, it's not taken from some fields out there, it's actually from the lake. So, you know, to my advantage, it's the soil doesn't have um uh the grass that i will not like it doesn't it will not have weeds because obviously they don't live on land that's to my advantage but at the same time um should i wait should i not i don't know does anyone have experience with this topic now there okay. is a real greenwood lake question yeah, I just told her I would be hesitant just because I, I do know that they do sometimes use herbicides in the, you know, in the lake to control the algae. So that, that, that you know, I, I spoke to Natalia, that, that'd be my main concern is that there would be some residue of that in the, in the, in the soil. So uh, again, if to get it tested, but you know, maybe, yeah, that, that would be a, a big concern of mine because, you know, I do know they do treat the water here. Right, so the herbicides that they do treat, they are uh, light. Um, you know, we have used some of the water from the lake. It doesn't kill my grass. And they have, I think, applied the last round before they dug up last year. And so um, it's just, it's a really thick ground, like 
earth is really thick. Um, it doesn't penetrate the water because it's so compact. So I need to probably air out, you know, rototill it with something, but I don't want to do that extra work. If I can just lay a sod on top of it, I would be perfectly happy. But if I, I don't know, should I be doing the work to air it out, to maybe add some peat moss to it? You know, that's, what's the prep step? And I have asked people on the Pine Island, you know, uh, where I'm getting sod from, eventually they just really don't have experience with that. Um, so. Have you thought about the cooperative extension? Is that something the cooperative extension should be able to answer? Because if they're giving it out in Greenwood Lake, then presumably a lot of citizens are getting it. And isn't that the sort of thing the cooperative extension should be, have some sort of answer for? Um, Has anybody got, had luck working with a cooperative extension on questions of this nature? Yeah. Or well, I would ask Stacy from the garden center. She'd probably be the best. Yeah. You can call the, call the garden hotline and if they don't know, they would probably look it up for you. But I agree with the pesticides and you know residue from, from motor oil. I would have the soil tested personally before I invested in sod. Okay. Sarah, am I correct that you can get the soil tested at Cornell Co-op? Yes, but of course, I don't know how you do it now. Well, yeah, I, nobody knows how you do anything now. <laughs> anything now. But yes, you can get, you can call the garden hotline. Hang on, let me see if it's on the refrigerator. Well, I had their number. I can- Oh, you have it? Okay. I had them, yeah. Um. Well, it left the refrigerator, but- oh. um, <laughs> Do you have it? No, I mean, I will get no, you look it up. Look it up and look up online because they, they have certain days of the week that they answer the hotline. And okay. a friend is a master gardener. They are answering the hotline, you know, through Zoom or whatever, like everyone else is. So I think that would be, you know, a good idea for you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry, one last one is of Marigold's uh, last. Marigolds survive down to really cold weather. Are they very hardy plants? I don't believe so, right? Uh, but... mm, they could take a light. You know, the problem is like in the village, we have places where there's a lot of protection. And so my plants will last a lot longer, but usually your like your vegetable garden, community gardens out more of an open field and they get frosted. So the answer of marigolds is they could probably go to, if it's not a, if it's a, a breeze, I mean, they would probably go to 32 degrees, not too bad, but they're not gonna take a hard frost. That's my idea. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Michael, do we do our uh, spin thing first or we do yes, the- Yes, uh... so we've been sitting down for at least 45 minutes. So it's time to do the shimmy in place. This, if you are <laughs> sheltering in place, stand up and sort of, Shake yourself around a little bit. And, and for some people, if that translates into a bathroom break, that's what it means. But anyway, we're going to shimmy in place now. And you don't have to do it on camera. You guys are really weird. <laughs> nice moves, Chad. <laughs> they didn't do that at the Democratic uh, meeting, right? I know. I, this is much more interesting. <laughs> Chad brought those moves all the way from San Francisco. Yeah, no, no, Brooklyn. <laughs> A couple of people looks like they're still shimmying, but I'm, I just want to make tell you some of these things. So it was really nice. People sent in the questions ahead of time. We had a few pictures. Uh, it really helps for the. Q&A session. On May 17th, you need to sign up with the library for this. There's a movie called Dirt, the movie, and you can watch it for free on filmsforaction.org. And uh, so basically what we'll do is ask people to watch it in advance and then um, sign up with the, with the library and we'll all discuss it at 7 p.m. on May 17th. What day of the week is that? Um, 
is that um, <coughs> Tuesday, I think. Yeah. Is that right? No. No, the 12th is a Tuesday. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Okay. Maybe, it's the, maybe it's the 19th. At any rate, it'll yeah, be I think on you the, said the 19th. I think you told me the 19th originally. I'm sorry, the 19th. Okay, it's, it's Tuesday. <laughs> it's two weeks from tomorrow. Uh, and you have to sign up through the library. That Films for Action, they've got some really good stuff. Um, I could share my screen for that in a second. But also, all of our Zoom sessions are being posted on YouTube by Peter Hall, and we thank him. And also, um, if you go to the Sustainable Warwick website, even to the front page, there'll be a little cloud there about our uh, garden, our Zoom garden plot. And uh, it will take you to the, a new web page that Christy put together. Uh, and all the YouTube links are there. Oh, and some of us have trouble with critters uh, uh, bothering our gardens. And um, we do have a Sustainable Warwick does have a Vegetarians and Friends. Uh, if you're, if critters have been barking you, maybe you could, maybe you want to brush up on your karma with animals and stop eating or, or eat less of them or something. And if you want to join us for an evening to discuss that, you'd be welcome to. Um, let's see, I'm going to stop my share for a second. And I'm going to try to find that. Um... So what, what time is that vegetarian and friends thing? 6.30 or? Uh... It's from 6 to 7.15 a week from tonight. Okay, 6. <clears throat> so this is the filmsforaction.org website. Um, and check out all of these Grow Food Not Lawns movies. There's like 13 of them. Pretty cool. So especially if, if anybody uh, goes through these and they see something that they think that uh, all of our group would like to discuss or many of us would, uh, you know, check it out and let, just let us know. That's filmsforaction.org and, and they have other things too. Environmental film is good. Planet of the Humans by uh, Michael Moore is out now. Planet of the Humans. <laughs> Controversial then. Okay, so, so now we want to turn to the weekly update and Steve and, um, and Jared, Garrett. Have, Garrett, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that, uh, uh, have agreed to, to do it. Um, I'm gonna turn off the recording. If Garrett, you wanna go first? I mean, sure, that sounds great, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Camera's back on, there you go. <laughs> no worries. Um, I, I will say that the, the coop was a process, you know? So. Thank you so much. Uh, next is going to be Steve, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, this week, uh, what have I been doing in the garden? I've been reinforcing some of my raised beds that have, a uh, couple of them are starting to rot after eight years. And for anybody that's um, interested, what I learned, and this was from uh, Dave Washburn, was to take uh, regular pine, uh, probably uh, southern yellow pine, and to, uh, to use, uh, what is it, uh, boiled linseed oil, and soak it or brush it on. And I've been able to get eight years pretty well out of uh, regular untreated pine. Um, but now it's starting to rot in a couple of lower corners. I'm, so I'm doing some reinforcing there. I'm continuing to do um, succession plantings of uh, kale, lettuce, um, bok choy, spinach, um, something else. I can't remember what else I'm planting out there. Uh, but everything's taking pretty well. Uh, getting back to the asparagus discussion we had earlier, um, and also tying into Michael's uh, comment about microclimates, I used to live on the top of uh, Warwick Turnpike. So it was probably seven, 800 feet elevation difference from where I am now. We used to have reliably uh, asparagus about the second week of May through the end of June. Where I am now, we're getting it as early as uh, mid to late uh, April. And uh, we would have been getting it couple of weeks ago, but we had a freeze and I lost a lot of the early asparagus. It was just starting to come out of the ground. So um, just like Michael or whoever else said it, um, I picked my first full asparagus meal, a couple of pounds of asparagus tonight. 
and we just had that this evening, so it was really wonderful. Um, I'm adding finished compost to my beds, um, putting up a fence for peas. I use climbing peas. Um, and I also, uh, for anybody that has excess peas, um, toward the end of the year, if you can find a source of peas and hang on to the peas, you could plant them throughout the winter, which I've been doing in about a six or eight inch pot. I plant peas, uh, bury them in about an inch of soil, tamp it down, water it, put it in a windowsill, and they sprout in about five or six days, and then let them grow for about another week, and you get about eight, 10 inch um, pea shoots, and just use scissors and snip them off and put them into your salad. So it's a great use of some extra uh, leftover peas. Um, that's about it from, uh, from my garden. Um, yeah, just looking, looking forward to some warmer weather and watch things pop. Oh, Steve, you don't mind, when, is, when, do you, when is your frost date? When do, you, when do you think it's safe to put out tomatoes and peppers and all that yeah, stuff? I, 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 tend to put, I tend to put those out very late um, just because I, I don't think that they do very well for me, um, even if we're not going to have frost until the soil is warm. Um, so I usually wait until June. And I always get late tomatoes and late peppers, but that's okay with me because I have plenty of other stuff early on in the season. The only other thing I was going to mention is uh, I do also plant potatoes. And potatoes require, you know, minimum of 45 degrees or maybe a little bit higher than that um, in the ground. Uh, soil, soil temperature before you can put them in the ground. Um, I'm waiting for my rototiller to come back from the shop, uh, which it's been there for <laughs> way too long. Uh, and I use it pretty much just for digging furrows. And uh, so I may just actually use a shovel and start digging them in because I, I do three 25 foot rows of potatoes. Mm. Well, thank you very much for sharing, I appreciate it. On, on the peas, when, when we grow peas, um, a lot of times we'll, um, you know, sometimes peas, it'll get too hot for peas before uh, they actually make, make the pea, right? Yeah. And so we eat the we eat the leaves on those, sort of like Steve was saying, you know, for the thing. If it's you get to the point of the season, you realize you're not going to have any peas. Well, you can still just eat all the leaves. It's and, true. Yeah. And you can buy those in the in like Chinatown or the Asian grocery markets because a lot of other people around the world eat those. Yeah. And, so now now we'll start the. Uh, you want to show that map you were going to show before and we'll... Uh... Okay, so we're, we were going to talk about... Um, um, oh, just a second. Yeah, so we had two wonderful presentations the first two weeks, but every week we'll... Hopefully we'll have some more presentations as we go along, but otherwise sometimes we'll just choose a topic that people could give uh, some of their thoughts on. And we're going to just do on garden preparation, which is a pretty large topic. But again, anything is welcomed as far as uh, advice or uh, wisdom. So this is Steve's garden map. Steve, do you want to just walk us through? Your yeah, sure. So this was, uh, I, I do basically the same one every year. And I've been doing it for 10 years that I've lived down here in Pine Island. And uh, I have four raised beds. Uh, you can see on the upper left-hand corner, three of them are horizontal and one is uh, vertical. Oh, yeah. um, I have two others to the right, one that says raspberries and the other says herbs. Um, those are four feet by, I think they're 18 feet. Um, and, and, you know, the whole idea of a map, is, as was mentioned last week during the discussion, is to keep track of what you've got. And so next year you can do rotation planting and not plant the same thing in the same location. I also use this to make notes. Uh, if you look at the upper center, I've got Bilicious Corn 61, and underneath that Bilicious Corn 621. So I put in two different uh, sets of, of corn, three weeks apart, and I've got the harvest dates. And the upper one, uh, I made a note that said it was very good, so it was a good yield. The bottom one, not so good because the raccoons got over the fence and 
it got the corn before I got it. Um, but anyway, this is just, it's just a, I find it's a good way of keeping track of what I've planted, where I've planted, what did well, what didn't. If you look right in the center in the horizontal, that's a, it's actually a grassy strip that runs the whole length of the garden. And I put little notes about the weather, like lots of rain, uh, August, September, October, hot and dry in July, cold, rainy spring, hard to get the crops in, you know, just, just for my benefit to know how things were year to year. And that, that's pretty much the whole deal. That's very good, thank you. What, is, that, is that eight and a half by 11 paper or? Yep, just eight and a half by 11. Yeah, I, I, probably, I probably could sketch out the whole garden and just photocopy it and reuse that, but I just draw it freehand every year. What are the total dimensions of your garden? 50 by 50. Nice size. And so a question about the garlic, that looks like a really huge area. You have a lot of garlic in there? Yeah, I, I typically plant lots of garlic because I don't eat onions, but I love garlic. And I, I give it away and I dry it and I, I keep garlic throughout the year. I usually plant about seven or eight different varieties. So that's usually planted in um, end of October, early November. Yeah, that looks great. Thanks. So if, we, if vampires come, we know where to go. We're going to Steve's <laughs> safe. Yeah. Does anyone else have any uh, advice they want to share about uh, preparing a garden or uh, thoughts or ideas? Well, I, I think it's, you know, I guess Steve brought up a good point. I think it's very important that uh, you make a point to try to grow what you like. You know, sometimes you, you I found early on, you know, you just get in love with some concept. You go, oh, I want to get all these different things. But the main thing is that you, that, you know, that you're going to eat them or your family's going to eat them. So, um, and, you know, try and try to, um, when, when you're prepping a site, you know, really think about that. So, and then think about how it's going to be when you, when it's fully grown. Because, you know, everything's very tiny. And then you get all excited and line up uh, many things. And then you realize that they're, little dot and they could you know become three four five six feet tall so that, that's important that's why it's good to have a diagram like steve did so you can kind of plan it out ahead of time because you get overly excited when you're just putting seeds in and everything's tiny so i think that's good to keep in mind i, I wanted to mention something we were talking about uh fencing and deer fencing and the, the and steve what kind of fence do you have around your garden I have welded wire fence that's six feet and then it's buried one foot and then it goes out a foot. So it's an eight foot fence, uh, eight foot welded wire with one foot out, one foot underground and six above the ground and secured by uh, cedar posts. Nice. So we, we have a similar fence. Oh, I should take a couple minutes and get pictures to share. Why don't you guys talk about something else? I'll find some pictures now. I'll, I'll just add that I also have, from the ground up, I've got 18 inches of chicken wire because rabbits can jump, but they can't jump more than 18 inches. And they can jump and go through uh, two by four welded wire with no problem. So anything, uh, Sarah, you want to add anything about garden prep or when thinking about a garden? Um, I sort of missed the last part of it. My Wi-Fi dropped out. I mean, at this point, the um, community garden, we've been kind of on a hold due to the COVID situation. And I went over and checked today. We put in peas, lettuce, um, chard, spinach, some other greens back in that March warm spell. You remember that? And greens are all coming up, and no one's been tending them, and they're they're in good shape. Our peas did not come up this year. I believe when we put them in, then right it was warm, and then right after that it got pretty cold. So generally, I put in a batch, and then if they don't germinate well, we put in a second batch. And uh, a couple of other people told me their peas didn't germinate this year. So 
I don't know if anyone else had a problem. Dad, you did too? Just, yeah. just have a question on that. Do you soak yeah. the peas before you plant them? You bet. Just like overnight, just like a one day? Yeah, one day. Yeah. Okay, that's what I do too. And, All right. And I've, I've put in uh, two rows of peas. The first row did very well and is coming up nicely. It sort of looked like Garrett's uh, garden. Uh -huh. And the other was kind of spotty, so I've gone back and reseeded with additional peas in between the things that aren't coming up. Right, right. Well, there's a there's a type of pea. It's it's a, a tall sugar snap pea that I'm partial to, and it wasn't available for several years. There was a problem with the seed, and last year I got some from a place called Harvest History. <laughs> Just a small packet, and I tried that, and they they did well. So this year, I went back to Johnny's because that particular strain was back in stock, and it was supposed to be fixed. So I don't know. I believe it was the weather. Yeah. But, but it's possible that's still a problem with that particular um, strain of seed. And we did have spinach winter over this year without any covering or anything. That's how mild it was. <laughs> wow. I, I want to share my screen now and show. So my my uh, deer fence is a lot like what Steve described, except for so here's if you can see here here's the top of the fence that's six feet high, and you can mm -hmm. sort of see a foot and a half of the um, it's a tighter fencing down by the bottom, mm -hmm. and underneath the ground it goes down a foot and out a foot, but up at the top what we did was added these little flag posts and a, uh, a clothesline that runs the whole way. And, and I have Tibetan prayer flags up. So if you're, this is, you know, looking for my upper story, this is what it looks like. So basically the, the wire fence makes a six foot fence. And then the flags up here are like a seven and a half foot fence. And they're right next to each other and the flags are waving and actually sending good karma down the wind to all the deer and everybody else out there, which is important. You have stacking functions, right? Uh, permaculture, we talk about stacking functions. So um, a deer can jump a six foot fence without a problem, but especially with this up, the only time they've come in is um, when somebody, mm. and I won't name names, somebody leaves the gate open. Oh. But, uh, other than that, they haven't come in. Okay, it was me, I did it, I admit. <laughs> I have uh, deer fencing on two sides of my property in the village not because I grow any vegetables due to the, the trees, but I love hostas and lilies. And they were just wiping out my hostas and lilies. So I put up this type of deer fencing on two sides and then regular picket with wire, with wires up atop, atop of the picket in the front. And, you know, they can't get a really long run in the village, but it's kept them out. And the extra wire, the picket's four foot because I have dogs, but the extra wire on top of the picket has managed to keep the deer out. Somebody before was talking about um, the deer chomped her tree. Um, one of the things before we got the deer fence, mm -hmm. we had a number of raised beds and we just had four foot fence around it, but there was like, there was no landing strip inside. And, and my neighbor suggested that if you put him up and sort of close, the deer would look at it and think it was like some sort of a trap. And we saw a deer on all four sides and we never saw any go in and, and no signs of them, um, you know, chewing anything inside either. So. Well, oh, it's, oh. in my front, I put, I bought a small shrub last year because the deer eat, you know, everything in the middle of the village. So I bought a, like, I buy only on sale and small to go in the front. And it, it was a, a red twig dogwood, which they did start eating, but I put fine bird netting around them now. And my Montauk daisies, they cover with fine bird netting. And they try to eat that and then it upsets them and they leave it alone for like quite a while. But that's not gonna work for an entire garden. Right. No. So, but for, for, but for um, Valerie's tree though, that, you know, that she sowed as the beginning, I, I, I still do this, um, so I'll take like a, uh, um, a four foot high of the welded wire fence 
And right. if, you just make a, if you make a cylinder from it, take 10 feet, yeah. to 12 feet and make a cylinder. Right. Some of the things you can do with that, but you can put it around a tree and a deer won't oh, yeah. to you know, destroy that or anything to get to the tree. They'll, they'll, it'll just be off ground for them. Well, that small tree, I just used deer netting all last summer, the fine stuff around my red fig dogwood. It was in a, in a big container out in, in the deer path. And once I put that fine deer netting, they, they don't like that stuff. They put it into their mouths and real, they don't see it. And then they start eating and it's very untasty and they leave me alone for a while. <laughs> That's really easy. You don't have to go get wire or anything. Now, you know, with, you know, with garden prep, and uh, some of what uh, Mike mentioned permaculture, I believe it's, you know, I think the key, most important thing is if you have time to uh, really observe your land as long as you could. You know, some people say even if for a year before you even grow anything possible, just to see where the sun comes in, how the wind is, you know, check, check your soil, check the, you know, how the, how the, how the water soaks in. I think, you know, because once you make a decision, you don't want to make a larger decision that later on you can't undo. So, you know, the longer you could observe your, your area is, is really important. And uh, permaculture, as Mike says, you know, likes to stack, stack different functions and um, do multiple things. And they have a thing called zones. So uh, to me, the important thing is, you know, zone zero is where you live. And then zone one would be the area you go to often. So it's very, you know, I think it's, you want your, you want your stuff you're growing to be as close to your kitchen door as possible. You know, the, you want your garden to be as close as you can to your house. It, it makes a huge difference whether you have to walk, you know, 200 feet or 20 feet, you know, to pick some herbs and you're, you're making dinner. So if, you know, if you can, obviously, I guess in Warwick and Pine Island, you guys have more of a deer problem than we do in Greenwood Lake, but take that into account as well. You know, whatever your zone one is, where you're going to visit, often and then you know come back to zone two would be like you know maybe chicken coop that you go to a little less often and 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 so on or go to zone five and if you have enough if you have enough land keep some of the land wide but in, you know in prepping your garden you want to observe you want to you know again grow what you like and you you know you want to think of zones and easy accessibility i, I believe is a, is a key and uh Anyone else have any uh, thoughts on uh, how they do? Yeah, I'll just jump in I, I, in agreement with what you said. Uh, for years, I had all my garden way down on the property. And about six or seven years ago, I decided to grow the herbs closer to the house, whether they're in pots or right, you know, right out, literally like right outside the door. I use them so much more often. and. Uh, you know, it's just, it's incredible. It really, if I could pull the whole garden closer to the house, I would. Um, but I, I truly understand the, you know, the value of having it closer. It's, it, it's made a world of difference. I mean, even just having, um, you know, like a, a drink and you put mint in it, you know, or, or something like, you know, um, iced tea with mint in it. You just walk right outside, you pick your mint and you put it in. It's supposed to like, you know, walking 10 minutes to wherever the garden is to, you know, I'm not just not going to do that, <laughs> you know? So just, reiterating what you said yeah i grow my herbs in pots on the deck and in a another area next to my deck and i've been doing that for years because my garden so to speak is is you know it's not that far away but i i don't know five city blocks should we say but when i'm cooking and i want an herb i just you know go out and snip some the big basil crops over the big garden when i want to do pesto but you can grow herbs and a lot of them winter over. There's many of them, if you put them in a large container and move them up next to your house, they'll overwinter, you know, for a number of years. So yes, put your herbs next to your kitchen. I see. And, uh, and son, so, sorry, to, Mike, you know, always, also always try to start small if you could. Yes. You're much better off starting, you know, small little garden than taking on you know, a huge project because you just like, like you, you know, weeding is an issue. You know, you're better off getting control of one little area and then moving from there. You know, it's, 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 you, I know you, I know people, you think big early on, I want to have, you know, 6,000 tomatoes and all this, but unless you're really going to have a lot of time uh, to spend on that, you, you know, you're better off starting small. 
I saw and I see people in the chat discussing uh, keeping their fruit tree safe from uh, squirrels and other uh, critters. It started with Gail saying uh, she has a peach tree. Go ahead, Gail. Why don't you explain that and we can discuss that. Gail, are you on mute? Um, okay. Um, yeah, sorry to change the subject, but it's been so frustrating because the first year that my peach tree had peaches, they were probably the most delicious peaches I ever tasted in my life. And that was just the first year. After that, I've had zero peaches, um, wonderful blossoms, um, lots of peaches growing. Raphael actually pruned it for me, so I know it was pruned properly. But I did hang um, um, with the soap, Irish Spring, it didn't do any good. Um, I bought a net, which I haven't put up yet, which is. I mean, because I need advice when one puts a net up um, so that it's they're pollinated to get it right. So when would I put a net up? And I'm not sure they're, it's squirrels, but I think they are. And then I also had someone recommend to me uh, either like silver things or like a CD or like, you know, like Christmas tin fo t Christmas foil that, you know, I haven't tried that myself because I got, hit pretty hard last year also. Like I had my first growing my fruit trees and then I came out and like, <laughs> they're all gone. <laughs> it's very disappointing. But, Do you uh, use the net? Do you use a net? No, I'm gonna get one this year. Yeah, I didn't get one. <laughs> I'm gonna get one. When, when do you put the net up though? Um, I would maybe, hopefully someone else could maybe Steve or uh, someone else might have a little more, or Sharon might have a little more wise date when to put the net up. Well, I mean, I think you should be able to put it up soon, right? Because I don't, I don't think I will stop the pollination of a net. That's what I'm worried about. My, my experience with squirrels was uh, with peaches and also with pear trees. They, they, uh, they waited until the fruit was just about ripe, yeah. like a week from eating. So I got in the habit of hanging the netting um, a few weeks before it would, anything would be ripe, okay. um, just because it was a big pain to manage the netting. Uh, and did, I, that, did, that, did that work? Did the netting work? Yeah, I mean, I had some success, but you know, squirrels will also tear apart netting if they see a nice piece of fruit. So um, I'd say it's worth a try, but don't expect miracles. I just want a peach. One, one peach. <laughs> Not a miracle. I just want a peach. Yeah. This is, this is people, part. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say some people also put bags around uh, fruit yeah. uh, just before it's ripe. Mm -hmm. uh, you know bunch of paper bags and you have to twist tie those around each of your pieces of fruit. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of work. Thank you. Well, Carl, are you going to say something, I think? Yeah. I, my husband and I were talking about this just the other day and I had this idea because um, we found that having those motion detector Halloween ghouls works on the bears and so i was thinking of hanging one near the fruit trees this year to see if it would scare away deer i don't know how well it would work with the squirrels but it's like the the masks and the skulls that start screaming and lighting up when somebody goes near it so that was something that we were talking about trying this year so, uh, you know, Jack, you know, you have some experience with this. So do you want to share whatever you've tried over the years? Um, you know, usually it's just, you need a really good fencing, you know, around the perimeter of the fruit trees, whether it's you no know, deer fencing and then the bottom, you know, chicken wire to keep the squirrels out. Uh, they also say if you let the grass grow long, the squirrels don't like jumping through tall grass, so that might help keeping the squirrels away from the trees. But that could be a whole nother, you know, line of issues. Uh, again, fetching, netting over the tree. I mean, once the tree gets bigger, that's not going to help with the squirrels. It's just going to go up the center of the tree anyway. Yeah, and I think. Wait, let me ask you a question. So with the netting, if you if you fence out, you know, a dozen trees or whatever you're doing and it's high and then you have the thing down below. So then you don't necessarily how high do you go with the fence and then 
So what stops something from jumping on the top of the tree? I don't know. Yeah. Nothing stops squirrels. Yes, yeah, squirrels are impossible. They, they I have feeders on my deck and the little devils, I watch them. I have a dog door and a poodle. The poodle runs out, they run away. Five minutes later, they're back. I've seen them hanging like from branches onto the squirrel proof dog feeders. They're, they're smart. Yeah. They're nasty, nasty little buggers. <laughs> in, in the gardening show that I listened to before, there, it's not on anymore, but he frequently cited the scientific name, evil squirrels. And I just, <laughs> evil squirrels. Yes. These people, these squirrels, it takes them about five minutes to, to satisfy their, their daily needs for what they need to eat. And then they have the rest of the day to go around and annoy you. Yeah. Or pigs, Take a bite out of the tomato and drop it right there. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're coming close to the end. Any, any other uh, comments or advice on a gardening preparation or any other quick questions? I just fed them cracked corn and they got tired. Okay. And I, I don't know if they, some people, some, we just bought some stuff like, a, you know, I don't know, like a coyote piss or a, I don't know if that, any of that stuff works as far as like powders or sprays of predators. But uh, we might give that one a shot over by us. All right, well, thank you. Oh, wait, got to get a cat, right? You leave it in the garden. There you go. <laughs> Get a few cats. Oh, well, the cats can do, cats can do, uh, do damage in the garden as well. So you gotta be careful. Cats and dogs could uh, do a lot of scratching and digging. Oh, oh yeah. I, I have, do you think all this stuff that we planted is going to get frostbitten this week? You know, those cool vegetable crops like bok choy and stuff? And I, th I think okay. the green should be good. The green should be all right. Yeah, they'll be okay. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Put any tomatoes Wait. or anything out, right? No, no, no. No, just cold weather stuff, like lettuce and uh, radishes and stuff. It'll be fine. My hostess got nipped the last time, but the all the cold weather things were fine. What about marigolds? Do you think they're going to have a problem? It's hard to say because there's... Like we were talking, there's so many micro um, microclimate areas around here. We're really worried. You have a lot of them. Yeah. Well. Yeah, we have two pallets worth. Is it easy to cover them? It's easy to cover s s the ones that are in the raised beds. The other mm -hmm. one, I have. I have bottles that I can cover them with, but it's so windy that I don't know how to secure the bottles to keep them from blowing away. Was well, this an open area? Yeah. You can just take sheets or, or uh, towels or any type of cloth. It's not gonna be a freeze. And if you're worried about damaging them, I would take some sheets, towels, I'll use anything in the fall and go out and just, you know, hold it down with some rocks and some and wood rather than get up in the morning and see my little marigolds ruin. It's worth it for one night. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, well, thank everyone. This was a great session again. We appreciate everyone's input and uh, We'll be here next week, same bad channel. And again, uh, as Michael said with the announcement, if you could watch a movie, I think I, I do think it's the 19th. And uh, Vegetarian and Friends. Is there a way they do, do, do people need to sign up for that, Michael? Um, yeah, you could email me or Sustainable War with Five if you're interested in joining Vegetarians and Friends Zoom dinner next, next Monday. Also, um, there's another announcement I'd like to make. So a lot of people know that the food pantries are really, um, are really overwhelmed these days. And so Sustainable Warwick and Community Together are collaborating on a matching fund. We've put together 5,000 bucks. And if other people will 
go to our website and contribute, you know, some, we will put all that money together and we have a way to divide it up among all of the local food pantries. Uh, you know, we looked at the size of the food pantries and who knew, but the Florida food pantries actually serves more meals than the uh, Warwick Ecumenical food pantry. And there's a small one would, out, in, there's a small I would one believe out in Pine that. Island. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a small one out in Pine Island. So mm -hmm. um, a couple of weeks ago, the, uh, the director of the Florida food pantry told us that um, in one week, she was like $1,000 over her budget. So you know, when we heard that, we thought we really should try to do something. So like I say, we've got $5,000 set to match donations. If anybody, or if you know anybody, a lot of people are, are really financially challenged these days. And so not everybody can do this, but if you are comfortable making a donation, we'd appreciate it and we will double it and send it out to local food pantries. That's very nice, thank you. I just want to uh, piggyback to that. I don't know, it, ha has that gone out officially yet in any email yet? Uh, it's on our website, <laughs> okay. and, and the email is supposed to go out. I haven't seen it from Christy yet. Well, we've actually gotten donations between yesterday and today, uh, which is which is incredible because I, I didn't think the email went out. And um, so the bar chart where we have where we have you know the five thousand dollars of funds and the matching amount of people, it's starting to grow. So it's really exciting that it's it's taking momentum, even though the announcement has not gone out yet. Okay. Yeah, it's exciting. Very good. All right, thank you all again. I appreciate it and uh, have a great week. Good luck with your gardening and you know, spread the word. Just let us know if anyone else wants to sign up. And thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks thank a lot. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night everybody. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.